with uh, deploying Drupal in the open cloud using OpenShift uh, here at the UN. And so, I mean, I'll say introductions. I'm Stephen Realma, Director of Engineering at Phase 2. I do a lot of work uh, with cloud platforms, with deployments, with setting up non-PaaS-based servers and also setting up PaaS-based servers. And of course, we also have Diane with us uh, from Red Hat, who is the Cloud Ecosystem Evangelist and Origin Community Manager. So Diane talked earlier about platform as a service. And I really think it's important to note that platform as a service is being seen as sort of a best practice across the industry. So like using platform as a service, because it really does make things that much easier, you know, for your administrators, for your developers. If you have just one environment that you have to target, it makes things a lot easier. So there's this website called the 12 Factor App. I was put together by a lot of folks who have been doing a lot of interesting thinking about how to easily build stable, secure applications uh, kind of in a modern way. So in the modern era, software is commonly delivered as a service. The 12-factor app is a methodology for building software as a service apps that are suitable for deployment on modern cloud platforms and can scale up without significant changes to tooling or development practices. So someone just talked about committing settings at PHP, right? You are on your local host, you maybe have your root database password in there, and what happens if you commit settings.php? Then, you know, if that's on GitHub, someone knows your password. I mean, they probably can't attack that directly, but then if they can find some other exploit in your server or something, they've got access to it. So, again, from the section of the 12-factor app called config, they say a litmus test for whether an app has all config correctly factored out of the code base is whether the code base could be made open source at any moment without compromising any credentials. So, in other words, if you write your apps in this way, it means that you could literally just give someone the code and they wouldn't have any secrets because all the things about what database do I use, how do I connect to the files that I need, all this stuff, that's gonna be kept somewhere else than actually in your code base. So the way that platform as a service platforms work around this, uh, the 12 factor app stores config in environmental variables. So environmental variables are easy to change between deploys without having to change any code. So like your main database server goes down, you need to point it somewhere else. I mean, you could use a virtual IP for that, but you could also just use a, you know, a given environmental variable. Unlike config files, like settings.php, there's little chance of them being checked into the code repo accidentally, and they're language and OS agnostic standards. So whether you're on Mac OS X or Linux or Windows, environmental variables are a thing, right? You're running a program and you can set path equals this or database URL equals this. And I mentioned that just because that's actually kind of a core tenet of working with something like OpenShift. Like one of the benefits when you get an app up and running is that you shouldn't, and I'll show you how we can avoid doing that. You shouldn't just, you know, when you spin up that app, you guys all saw that you got information about credentials for your application, right? It said, here's your username, password, database. But OpenShift also makes it all available to you in environmental variables. So in your settings.php, you know, we'll take a look at how that, how the built-in Drupal Quick Start does and how we can do it you can just read that out of the environment. And that means then again, if you need to spin up a second copy, you can just make a new app through RHC or the console, push the code and it'll work. It'll just be connected to the database. You might have to restore your database, but it'll work. So this is something that, you know, not just Heroku and OpenShift and platform as a service providers are talking about. A lot of folks are talking about, at least like with this thing, with environmental variables, this is the way you should store your configuration, period. So we talked earlier about cartridges. Um, and there's certainly a good number of cartridges in the OpenShift ecosystem. So OpenShift provides you know, some languages, PHP, Perl, Ruby, you name it, some other services, some database. They're deployed into applications through cartridges. So cartridges can be web frameworks. They could be databases, monitoring services, connectors to like something else externally completely. So some of the technology cartridges that OpenShift has, you know, I sort of showed the oops. I sort of showed this already, you know, built in, you've got several versions of PHP, quite a few versions of Python, Ruby, you've got Java, you have Node 06 and 010, you know, different versions of MySQL. There is, there is also support for Jenkins built. So if the built-in build process of OpenShift isn't enough, and the built-in build process is basically take what's in the Git repo, put it in Apache's doc root, and that's it. If you needed to do something, you know, bigger than that, like if you wanted to run Drushmake, or you wanted to run Compass, on your files, let's say, to generate your theme. That's also possible using Jenkins. And I'm actually going to step back here a bit and say, you know, you can make your apps with different cartridges. We made an app that had a PHP cartridge and a MySQL cartridge. But kind of the cool thing about OpenShift is that ultimately, you know, OpenShift Online is just a bunch of machines out in Amazon EC2 running Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6. 
That actually also means that every single one of those machines and actually every single one of your gears, it might be running Ruby as the web framework cartridge, like the main thing that serves web requests, but it also has access to like, it can run PHP if you need to, or it could run Node or it could run Java. So we've actually taken advantage of that, like to use the Jenkins cartridge because the Jenkins cartridge also has PHP on it. It has like all the binaries are still available. So you could actually still like install Composer and grab some things down and then push things to your application. Or you could do a bundle install to install, you know, Compass and some SAS extensions. Use that to build your theme and then send it over. Well, it's you, almost. That's true, and you, you can all, you can also only have one web framework cartridge. So there's still like you still have to say a primary like Ruby will respond to requests. So you have one web framework, but then yeah, you, you could add Mongo and MySQL and Postgres and a Jenkins builder and like whatever else you want. And even if you don't put the cartridges on, like the cartridges for PHP Perl, those are actually mainly responsible for saying like serve this app to the world. You still have the binaries available. You could still run Perl like from your Ruby cartridge app. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, like you could. I mean, and virtual uh, virtual websites that run on a virtual on a single virtual machine. Not even virtual machine, but yes, exactly. Yep, yes, that that's correct. So yeah, like, and then you know, Diane mentioned there's also PHP MyAdmin if you really need to you know go in and take a look at your database. Although as I'll show, we can also actually we have Drush on here, and so we can actually also go and just like do a Drush SQLC if we want to. There's also a cron cartridge, and what's really great about that is that you know. Even if you're not using Jenkins, like with Drush or with Drupal, you probably want to run cron, right? You're going to clear out old sessions. You're going to maybe remove files that aren't being used anymore. So OpenShift also has a cron cartridge. And in your repository, you can put in these little markers that says every hour run this thing and every day run this thing. So that stuff's actually kind of all built in. And OpenShift will like just take care of all these housekeeping tasks for you as part of your application. And again, anything that runs on Red Hat Enterprise Linux, you can make into a cartridge. Like basically, as long as you can respond and say, it's going to start, it's going to stop. If it's a web framework cartridge, or even if not, as long as you can do that, it works. So like, you know, to give you some examples, OpenShift Online and I think Enterprise with software collections, I'm not sure, but Online and Origin and maybe Enterprise, they support PHP 5.3. They now also support PHP 5.4. And that's just because there's also PHP 5.4 repository that's available from Red Hat. But before that was the case, like I started using OpenShift a little over a year ago. Um, and we wanted to make this Drupal 8 cartridge. Well, Drupal 8 at the time required like PHP 5.3.10, it now requires 5.4. And so we couldn't run Drupal 8 out of the box on OpenShift. But literally all I had to do is I kind of grabbed the RPM binaries for PHP 5.4.16 or whatever it was, ripped them out of there, made them into a cartridge. And now there was a PHP 5.4 cartridge that anyone could use. Like if, you, if it runs on rel slash CentOS, you can make it into a cartridge. Yes, there are a lot of them out there. Like, there's a JVM-based Lisp programming language called Clojure. Yeah. yeah. If, It, there is a Drupal 8 quick start. So a quick start is basically a thing that says spin up these X cartridges and this starter repo. That's that's the whole thing that it is. So yeah, there is a quick start. Just like you guys did like the instant app, that's also a quick start. I didn't know about, uh, I know what uh, Sentry was before today. So that's in there as well. You could, yeah, you absolutely could. I think there is a Symphony cartridge. There's a, there's like, there are like five Moodle cartridges. There's Joomla, there's, you, you name it, Minecraft. You, Yeah, or like programming languages, you know, Clojure is a JVM Lisp. I actually, I'll show you an app that I have running on here. There's a cartridge for that. Go, the language, there's a cartridge for that. Like lots and lots of downloadable cartridges. Maybe, I, I haven't checked. Redmine.
Yep. So again, I mean, this is probably a community card. I mean, we could actually even try it right now if we want. So we'll do this. We'll just call this red mine. And sure. So I'll go back to my slides. We'll let Godin's up. I'm not a red mine expert, but we'll see. But yeah, I mean, anything that runs on rel, you can make happen. And I'll show you a couple that I've, I've made. So yeah, community cartridges. Uh, there's actually Redis. So we can talk like if you want to use Redis to do some caching on your Drupal site, that works. And you can add that to your app. Um, there's Varnish. So the OpenShift Origin community site that Diane was talking about that's running on OpenAtrium, we put Varnish in front of it. Because Drupal can be kind of slow when you put a bunch of modules on it. So you run Varnish in front of it. Like I said, Go, the programming language, Clojure. There's also Memcache if you want to use that for your Drupal caching. So lots and lots of different technologies are available. It's free, open source, downloadable cartridges that you can add into your app. So yeah, as I was saying before, each app can have as many cartridges as it wants, but there is one and only one web framework cartridge. So you do have to say it's a Ruby app or a PHP app or a uh, JBoss EAP app or something like that. So like that's the only restriction. You have one of those, and then you can add like a SQL database and something else and something else. So you get one and only one of those. Because yeah, that's ultimately like, that'll determine what the Git repo is. Like if you start with a Ruby app, it'll have a sample index.rb. If you start with the PHP app, it'll have index.php. Uh, the main web server in this web framework cartridge binds to a specified port and a host. So actually the way that this works is, uh, this is a little different than how some other platforms work. Um, actually, like inside of your application on your gears, you're listening on an internal loopback address. So you know how like your, your computer is 127.0.0.1, right? That's localhost. So actually your app binds to something in that internal address space. Like it'll be 127. Dot something. And that's, again, part of the security framework to make sure that, you know, from outside, OpenShift can get a request coming in, route it to your app. But, like, if your app is here and your app is here and they're all in the same node, they can't talk to one another. That's another part of the security that is a big part of why people like using OpenShift and even deploying around the firewall is that, you know, it, it listens on its own internal port so that you can't, you know, maliciously, like, go kind of snipe on your neighbors that are on the same machine. Right, exactly. Yeah, so you could run 10,000 apps, and they're all protected from one another. Oh, oh, sorry, I had a question. So, well, we're not actually going to spin up a PHP application. You guys have all done this. Let's actually go see how Redmine is doing, maybe, because I'd be curious to see. We're still going. Yep. All right, well, with that in mind, let's... Um, I'm going to talk... I'll get back into this, and then we can jump back to this when we're done with Redmine. So working with OpenShift... Um, you know, as we talked about, there's a couple things that just kind of happen as you're working with OpenShift. One of them is Git-based deployments. So, you know, as we kind of talked about earlier, when you make a new app, it gets a Git repository. Based on whichever web framework cartridge you've chosen, like is this PHP app, is this a Java app, that'll determine what's in that Git repository. And actually, if you use the command line tools, which we'll install and show you later on, it'll actually even automatically clone that repo for you. So you can say like RHC app create Drupal, da 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 It'll make it, and when it's done, it'll clone the repo. So then you can CD into there, you know, Drush DL views, Git push, and it'll deploy. So, yeah, just the way that you deploy is to just push new code to it. When you push, it's going to restart all of your cartridges by default. So if you're running MySQL and PHP, it'll restart both of those when you push. And then you've got your new code deployed. So as Diane mentioned, you've also got... Sessions that way? I mean, for people who are... You would for a very short amount of time while well, like MySQL is being restarted. But you can disable that from happening. We'll talk about that later. You can set up what's called hot deploy mode, so it actually doesn't restart any of your services. And then it'll be no interruption. Yeah, like uh, some users on your site can kick them off. Right, exactly. And so hot deploy mode actually lets you do that, where we can set that up so that yeah, it'll just like deploy right away. So yeah, you do get SSH access. I mean, it's not privileged SSH access. You can't go in and like sudo yum install whatever. That's why we have downloadable cartridges so that you can actually just like pull any of the stuff that you want to onto your gear. Uh, and so when you're SSH'd into your gear, you do have access to do a couple different things. There is a script called gear on there, um, which is actually maybe a bit misnamed, but with this, you could actually restart any one of your cartridges. So if you did want to restart PHP for some reason, you could, or if you had to restart MySQL, you can do that from on the on the gear itself. Like now when you're working with the Drupal quick starts, you also have Drush in this environment and it's set up to point at the place where on the gear where your application is deployed. So if you want to do like a Drush CC all, you 
can do that. If you want to do a Drush SQLC to go and actually jump into MySQL and take a look at something, you can. It's all set up for you automatically. Um, can you set up like, the database Yep, absolutely. So like the cron cartridge is how you do that. Right. You can set up something to run daily. It could run like Drush, SQL dump, you know, pipe that and then send it to email or do something like that. Well, not necessarily. I mean, there, there's nothing. Can you, can you get assigned priorities? Like uh, you could ionize it if you wanted to, sure. Yeah. You could say ionize equals like negative 10 and then run it so it would run at a lower priority than anything else. Yeah, definitely. Or again, like, you know, with Drupal specifically, you could also set up the backup and migrate module, which I think has a cron task that will do this for you and it would be the same sort of thing. So, yeah, there's lots of different options that you have. Sure. So you don't necessarily, like, yeah, you can definitely do that. You could just spin up one of your app and you could call it, you know, dev dash whatever, da da da, stage dash whatever, live dash whatever. So it, you know, there's not native tools built in to do some of the things you get with like a, you know, you can't like necessarily pull a database back from one to the other like you get with like Acquia or Pantheon. Although again, you could actually make remote Drush aliases for all of these. So you could do like Drush at prod or Drush SQL sync at prod at dev. And it would do that because these are ultimately just still Linux machines. You can SSH in to run the command, pull it down, push it back up. So, yeah, that kind of workflow isn't necessarily built in. But, yeah, because this is a platform as a service, you could use the same repo, push it to three different gears. Yeah, absolutely. So you, you can set that sort of thing up. So not built in. I think the OpenShift operations team who runs online does some of that for you, basically. Um, yeah, but there's not one like built in necessarily. Although again, like actually part of the gear definition, you, you kind of can control how many requests per second like each gear can make. So there's not something necessarily built in. But again, if you wanted to add that, you could certainly like, if you had a Apache module that you like for doing that kind of thing, you could set up your own version kind of of the PHP cartridge that would have that built in and that could handle that sort of thing for you. I actually don't know if there's any. That's that's a good question. I mean, it probably wouldn't be too tough to tell because actually, like, we'll take a look in there earlier. Like, basically, everything's just running as the user that is on your gear. So it would be pretty simple to say, oh, I, I can't connect to this. So I don't know of any built-in. I mean, again, there might be, like, a Nagios or a Sensu or a something like that cartridge. So I don't know. But it would certainly be possible to do it. Yeah, so the thing is that right now, there are some of those things that are built into the PHP cartridge that you control with environmental variables. So you can spin up your app, you can then set the appropriate environmental variable for like PHP memory or something like that, and then you can restart the app. and it'll, Or you can even just restart the PHP cartridge and it'll pick it up. So there's some of those. There's, there's a lot of work kind of still being done on that currently. Like currently you can't set the APC SHM size. So if you have a pretty big code base, you might start hitting up against that. Now, third-party cartridges can do that. Actually, the Pressflow cartridge we'll tell you about later actually makes that configurable. And so, you know, like, this is a case where uh, we're actually working with some of the team. Like, all the development for Origin actually happens in the open, and, like, Origin feeds into online, too. So you could say, hey, I want to be able to adjust this particular parameter. So some of those things are, are tunable by environmental variables. And then with the client tools, you can actually say, I want to set this environmental variable for my app. And if they're not, then you could either, like, fork your own version of the cartridge to put that in place and then get it accepted back upstream and they'll like put that back in. If you're hosting your own OpenShift origin, you're in control. So the only real limitation is, is the gatekeeper to keep online up and running. Right. So it, the only obstruction we have, it's all open source, but the, the DevOps team behind OpenShift Online regulates it, which is why I don't have control access over the Linux side. But yes. Yep. 
Yeah, so actually I think well, we can head back and see how Redmine's doing. And then I'll SSH into an application. Maybe then we can, in a little bit, uh, I have a thing later on where we'll, we'll actually set up the client tool so that you guys can all SSH into your Drupal applications too so we can see what it looks like. But actually, let's, here we go. All right, so we do have a Redmine instance set up, apparently. And there's Redmine. Now again, let's let's see if yeah. The README in GitHub usually tells you what the you always always you've all just launched your Drupal thing. Remember to change your password. Diane said. Remind you. Password in plain text. Yeah. There we go. It's Redmine. Could uh, make a project. Right. Well, and again, actually, it depends. I'll have to look at how this one is set up. But actually, this has the this has the Redmine source in it. So like, this repo is what your Git repo will be. So if you can just like, I don't know, if you install plugins by putting them into the plugins folder, we could just Git clone this, put in the plugin, Git push, done, and then you have your plugin. Like, and then when you push, it'll do the deploy. Not using Jenkins even. Use it actually is just using Git post receive hooks. So I mean, yeah, here I mean, so let's do this. I'll. Um, so the one downside is that the Drupal quick start you guys started up with has an empty Git repo. The Drupal quick start that we'll spin up later has a full Git repo with Pressful Seven that we can do this on. But let's actually do this with Redmine. So I'll show you guys through the whole kind of process for doing this. All right, so I'm going to do an RHC. So I'm using a tool called RHC. We'll set it up a little later. RHC is the command line tool for accessing any OpenShift instance. It can talk to Origin. It can talk to Enterprise. It can talk to Online. By default, it's going to talk to Online because that's where all of our stuff is hosted. And so I called my app Redmine. And if I do an RHC git clone, it's going to connect SSH info. And then it'll actually just pull down um, my app. There we go. So it's been cloned. Yep, so, I mean, I'll actually even do a simpler test maybe um, where I can just make a So I just added a file called hello.txt, right? And I'm going to push it. And so now what's happening here, this is the deploy process. So by default, it will stop all the cartridges, deploy the code, then restart all the cartridges. So it's going to stop MySQL and Ruby. And when I say Ruby, that actually just means Apache running like Mod Passenger to be able to run Ruby code. So it's going to do this. It's going to, it's, so this will run bundle install because there's a gem file connected to this. And then it's going to get it ready, put it all together, and then it'll restart the cartridges. So it'll start MySQL, it'll start Ruby. And then when it does that, I should be able to hit hello.txt and it'll go. Yep. And it also actually like one of the things that was added recently is OpenShift keeps track of a certain number of your previous deployments too. So if you have to roll back, you can do that. I mean, you could do the same thing by just changing master and pushing back to your server again. Okay. So we started MySQL and then we're going to start Ruby probably in a sec here. And then when that happens, uh, we'll have that hello.txt available. So Oh, right, it has to start up Rails and do the asset pipeline. Da, 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 da. Run the database migrations. Yeah, so it's doing all the stuff that you might have to do by hand, like running the migrate scripts, starting the asset pipeline. Like the the, the repo in here is, is taking care of doing all that for you. Yep, so, and again, that's the real benefit of Platform as a Service is I'll show you some of the things that like the, the Drupal cartridge I've been working on does. Like it can automatically, my Drupal cartridge will do a drush CC all after you push. So you don't have to worry about like getting rid of all that. So that's okay. So it's up, it completed. And now finally my git push is done too because the app restarted. So I don't know if I'll be logged out or not. No, I was. Unfortunately not. The Drupal 7 quick start that's on there right now doesn't use the git repository. The, the 
the press flow of seven one that I'll show you does. And so you will have it. And we're, we're actually like, we're trying to work with the, the OpenShift team to maybe switch so that this will become the official one that you get when you hit the Drupal seven one. So we'll, we'll get you there by the end of the training. If you were to do it with yours, you'd probably get an empty repository. Cause right now the way the quick start works is just kind of like downloads it into a place. So we will get our own disk row and use that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'll, I can show install, well, Installing Atrium takes a long time because there's a lot of modules. But yeah, you absolutely could. We, we actually already have Atrium as a quick start for, for OpenShift. Um, we're working on getting other distros up there too. Yeah, and like basically, if they're available on Pantheon, it's very easy to like pull over from the drops repos for Pantheon and put them into OpenShift. But, oh no. You know, this could be my ignorance of Redmine, but maybe it won't serve. Well, maybe Redmine won't serve hello.txt files. Oh, okay. Well, just to prove to you that it's there, yeah, it. I'll use the SSH thing, and I will RHC SSH into Redmine. And here I am, totally yell at you and say, it's quite powerful. You might damage things. Again, not a ton that you can do, because when you re-push, it's just going to redeploy everything from Git and restart for you. Like, And most of it is pretty locked down. So like, if you try to completely overwrite your Apache config, it won't let you. Like, You're not going to be able to. But it's still the disclaimer. That, like, you kind of know what you're doing. Um, so I'm actually kind of jumping ahead here, but I'll... That's fine. So as I mentioned before, like all this stuff that your app uses is in environmental variables. So if I do an export here, I'll actually do an export command to show all the environmental variables and then pipe it to the less command. So here's all of the environmental variables that are here. Now, some of these are not necessarily unique to OpenShift. Like home is a regular variable you'd see on any server. Lang, LCCD type. So maybe a better thing to do would be, I'm gonna say export, and then I'm gonna grep for OpenShift and then I'm gonna to go to less. And so yeah, here's where you start to see like some of the actual um, unique things of configuration that are stored for OpenShift. So like, here's all the MySQL information, right? And the Redmine Quick Start is set up so that it will know that it can, it'll figure out what MySQL DB host to connect to from this environmental variable. And the same thing with the password, um, the port, the username or there's like a full URL version of it. So never in the Redmine setup here or in the Git repo does it mention these, it just reads them from the environment. So that way, if you set up Redmine 2, like another app that had your custom plugins in it, you could push and it would be there. Um, so there's lots of these, you know, we'll see some for Ruby too. I had mentioned that Ruby or any of these web cartridges are gonna connect on an IP and a port that's not publicly accessible. So in this case, it's actually going to bind to this internal IP, 127.11.104.129, and it'll find on port 8080. And then when a request comes in from outside, OpenShift reach in and know to like proxy to that port and send your stuff back out to the world. But if I tried to hit some other at, like IP internally, I couldn't. I couldn't. Sure. Oh yeah, absolutely. This is, yeah. Yeah, you can, it's used through piping. Sure, it's uh, you just export is the command, then you pipe it to grep OpenShift, and then you pipe that to less. And so the less part is what makes it easy that I can just go up and down here. Yep, and it's full shell access. So you have a full, I mean, it's basically bash on a Red Hat Enterprise Linux box and anything that you have the appropriate authorization to do, you can. Like, you know, I, I could do, let me, so I'll try doing some things that like, hey, I wonder if PHP is installed in this box. Oh, I, I can't have access to that or, I really want to yum install Nginx. Oh, right, it can't open the yum packages database. So I don't have the ability to do a lot because I'm not a super user, but yeah, like any of these commands, including like on, on Drupal Drush, I can run and it's just, it's a shell, it works. Yeah, I mean, I've actually thought, well, it would be just like a distro, like I've, I've actually thought, Maybe, you know. Yeah, you probably could. I mean, you'd still have to make an install profile that did that, I think. Because, I mean, it's ultimately still going to be running Drupal. But, yeah, you you totally could. Like, if you, without having a distro, if you just had, like, your own internal thing where you said, here's the 10 options, like, kind of like Sony did back in the day. Like, yeah, I want a forum on this one. I want a river of news. I want a this. You could absolutely do that. Yeah, uh, it depends. I mean, again, so you don't like, it can't, it can't like prompt you. It can't go to the command. You would, yeah, but you could, you wouldn't even need to write a custom script. You could probably just write an install profile that had those like options to check off and it would work. 
And then I will show you later on the Presto cartridge I have actually makes it so that as soon as your app URL comes up, uh, you're, you're taken to the, like the install screen for it. So as long as you could make that into something that was like web accessible, which I think might work best as an install profile, yeah, you absolutely could. And so you could have it start out with like all the set of modules, but they wouldn't be installed by default. You could, I think you could even make it so that was the only option. Like when you went to the install screen, it would auto select your profile and then you just have like the 20 check boxes. Yeah, absolutely. I've thought about making like, in addition to just the regular press flow one, like maybe a, a small install profile that could like install and set up Elysia cron and backup and migrate for you. So it would automatically do a database backup per day, like to the data directory. There'd be some neat things that you could do. And I've been thinking about like doing those in the future too. So anyway, I, I still haven't actually shown you guys the thing that I wanted to, which is that we do have hello.txt here, even though Rails is not gonna serve it to us. So there are a few more things. Um, there's a couple of locations in the gear that are special. So by default, whenever you deploy, there's a, a place called the repo directory. And that's literally where your Git repo gets put. And anything that's in there gets wiped out because it's gonna override it with whatever you have in your repository. So this also means that like, if you had your Drupal files directory there, it would wipe it out. So there's another thing called the data directory that survives between you know, deployments of your app. And so like in the Drupal quick starts, your files directory is actually put in that data directory and just sim linked into place at sites default files. So I could go to OpenShift repo dir, and here is my app. And now I can vim hello.txt, and there's high OpenShift. So it did deploy it, it's just Rails, it's not letting us view that, basically. So any questions about kind of SSH access or deployment? So you, you did vim, not VI? I did. If it doesn't have VI, it probably also doesn't have Vim, um, but I'm not sure. I mean, I might, I could actually probably also do VI. Yeah. yeah okay. so, so this, does it have Emacs? Oh, it does. I don't know how to work Emacs. Uh, Control X. Control CX. Yeah, yeah, like, uh, Someone has to help me get out of Emacs now. Yeah. I thought it was Control X, Control C. Yes. Okay. We're out of Emacs. And then, yes, you always have, I should know, I mean, I like Lisp, so I should learn Emacs, yeah, but. Well, yeah, again, so these are, I mean, they're just RHEL 6 machines. Now they're, you know, they're kind of locked down, so you can't like hit, you, know, you can't yeah. hit RPM query, but yeah, they have a lot of those things. And again, if you're running your own origin and you wanted, you know, let's say, do you guys know SL? Hang on, this is gonna bug me. Do you know SL? So SL is designed to show you a train whenever you mistype the LS command. <laughs> so if you wanted to install SL on your machines, if you're running Origin or Enterprise, you could. Because, you know, again, anything, any program that's globally available, anyone who's like SSH into a gear can run. And then also if you have a downloadable cartridge, that's where you could like, you could grab in another version of Nginx, another version of Ruby. Like that's how they work. Generally, like the built-in cartridges are responsible for putting binaries in the system and that's how they run. But yeah, if you wanted a newer, if you wanted PHP 5.5 on online, you could do that. You just have to put the binaries in your downloadable cartridge and run them from there. Whereas like, because this has the PHP cartridge, it also means that, well, so you can actually also do like all the flags like AFL. Oops, that's ADL. Then there's someone yelling help as you go by. And uh, if you do the capital F, so it'll fly. Um, unfortunately, Z shell was correcting my mistake for me. So I had to run it by hand. But Steve, yes. That What's that? Well, you'd have to, I mean, so this is just a Git repo like any other, right? So if I, so I'm, I'm inside of my Redmine repo now that I cloned down. If I do a Git remote dash V, the origin is literally the gear because this is a non-scaled app. It has a single gear, which contains all the cartridges. So in this case, it contains the MySQL cartridge, the Ruby cartridge, probably the cron cartridge, I'd have to say. So yeah, it's literally like this is, and you could do this with any server that you have SSH access to. But yeah, Scott, I mean like, so Diane and I were working on the OpenShift community site, which is an atrium site, and we worked out of Bitbucket. So like people would work, they would submit pull requests to Bitbucket, then we could accept the pull request, 
pull it down from Bitbucket, push it to the app, and then that would deploy it, right? So you can use, excuse me, you can use basically any workflow you want, or again, you could set up Jenkins. So like if you set up the OpenShift Jenkins so that it had access to your Bitbucket, you could have it pull every five minutes if there were changes, build them, and then like make that live on your site. So it supports a lot of different workflows. No, I don't, well, I don't think, that's interesting because you can configure the Git plugin so it'll just like accept it from an upstream. But I mean, basically like with the Git based pushes, it'll take by default, whatever is on master will get deployed. So like whatever you manage to merge in now, right, it could, you might have to like pull down and merge locally first and then push, but basically like whatever is on your master branch is what will get deployed when you push. Right, yeah. Like you wouldn't want to put your files directory or anything like that. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, yeah, so that's kind of a demo of the, you know, the shell based capabilities, the ability to do that. So, so let's actually, you know, we're we, actually, let's get, we'll get back onto Drupal and then I'll show like some of the power of this. So I'm going to go back to my slides and we'll go through a couple more things and then we'll probably have about half an hour left so that we can probably do this. So that was kind of a, a quick tour of SSHing in. You know, you've got the data directory, which is persistent between deploys. You've got the repo directory. That's where OpenShift puts your stuff when you push it. So yeah, the gear layout, we kind of went through this. OpenShift repo dir, uh, an environmental variable like everything else, is where the actual deployed code lives. Uh, the OpenShift data dir is a safe spot that'll stay put between deployments. So like you'll see when we when you actually look at the Pressflow cartridge that I'm showing or the, the Drupal 7 quick start, you know, like you put the Drupal files directory there so that if you've uploaded 20 pictures, they don't get kind of blown away when you deploy. And then, yeah, just as I did, if you ever wanted to see every single environmental variable that's been set, uh, you can use the export command when you're on the gear. I should also mention, uh, so we were talking earlier about like doing PHP configuration via environmental variables, or even if like your app needs another environmental variable, you can also use the RHC tool to set a custom environmental variable. So if you have to set like, you know, my Google Calendar URL or my Google Calendar token, you can do that per application using RHC, the command line tool. So even if you need some other environmental variable to hold like a secret piece of information so that you don't have to have it in your repository, you can do that. And again, like you could set that differently for dev, test, and live. If you had like a different Google Analytics account, let's say, and you didn't want to commit that to your Drupal code, you could put that in an environmental variable. And then you could read it back in in your settings.php to say, well, pull from the environment. And that way, again, you never have to like you know, deploy that confidential stuff. You don't have to put that in source code, but it's still available for your app to use. So the PHP cartridge, um, we take a look, the PHP cartridge, when you get a Git repository from it, typically the document root is in a folder called slash PHP. So like, I'm gonna show an example that we'll go back to a couple times. Um, and that is gonna be sad hello.txt, not there. Uh, github.com. So I have something in my GitHub called the Pressflow. Oh, I hope I get this right. The Pressflow 7 Quick Start. And this is a, we'll talk about Pressflow 7 in a bit and what it gives you, but um, I humbly call this the best Drupal 7 Quick Start for OpenShift. We'll, we'll see about that. But uh, so this is, uh, and the repository, so this is the Quick Start, right? A Quick Start is just a set of cartridges and a repo. So by default, up until about, I think, March, Diane, um, the, the document route was always slash PHP. So you had to like put your application, whether it was WordPress or Drupal or Mambo or Joomla, whatever you're using in a directory called PHP. OpenShift has actually since made it so that the cartridge is kind of smart and it will try and detect where you have your files. So like it'll look first in slash PHP. If not, it'll just look in the root. So you could literally just take a verbatim copy of Drupal 7 push it and it would work now. It doesn't have to be in the PHP directory, but you might see a lot of quick starts still using that because that change was introduced only maybe a month ago. So like, yeah, in here you'll see like for the Presto 7 quick start, that's all in PHP. Um, right, and you can put that wherever you want. And then there's a couple other things in there. So there's also a directory called dot openshift. And the dot openshift directory is where you can, whether you're starting with a quick start or whether you just like make your own app and then start putting it this is where you can kind of hook in and do special things like around when your application gets deployed or like when MySQL gets started, if you wanted to do something. So there is a directory called action hooks in there. And this is where you can literally hook in and say, after PHP starts up, 
do this thing, or before MySQL stops, do this thing. So like the thing I mentioned about the files directory, that's actually something we do like after PHP starts, we sim link the files directory back into place. And I'll show you real examples of that in the cartridge, uh, the quick start, sorry. There's also a directory called markers, not really useful for a lot, except that thing we are talking about with hot deployment, where you can make a file called hot deploy in there, and that'll mean that it won't restart services when we push. So I'll, I'll show that later on. So yeah, these are all the things that'll be used as the document. It'll look, I think it looks for an index.php file or maybe just the existence of these directories period. So it'll try any of these in the Git repo. So this is why you could literally just push Drupal 7 and it would work, but just know that like PHP used to be the default. So that's where it is. And when I put these slides online, here's the March, 2014, like kind of new feature update from the OpenShift online team that talks about that. So yeah, there's also these action hooks and they run during deploys when services cartridges are started or stopped. So like these are kind of the action hooks that deal with um, the app itself being deployed. So there is a pre-build that will run like the very first time your app is deployed to OpenShift. So you could do some special things here like make a .drush directory, for example, and like set up a drushrc.php. As a Drupal example, that's what you could do. Build will happen then after the build, deploy will happen before your code is deployed. So like when you do a git push before it gets deployed, deploy will run. And then finally post deploy is after your code has been deployed and everything is started up. Now, if you also have to like tie into a specific thing, like if you want to tie in and say, after MySQL is started do this or before PHP stops do this, there's four of these. There's pre-start cartridge, post-start cartridge, pre-stop cartridge, post-start cartridge. And that's, you just put the cartridge name in there. So pre-stop MySQL lowercase or post-start PHP lowercase. So that's where you can hook in and say like, if you have to do something after Apache stops, you do it there. So you have that capability. And again, you can put in whenever you want. I'll show you some of the things we do in the press flow quick start a little later. Yeah, you could absolutely. By default, it'll only make one of them, but yeah, you could totally just go in with the username and password, like your account on the MySQL gear is root. So yeah, you could totally, you could put in a second, third, fourth database. Absolutely. What's that? That's right. You could also add phpMyAdmin to your app and just add 20 databases or do whatever you want. Yep. Those are both possible. It's pretty nice. <laughs> so yeah, uh, you know, hot deployment. If you do make an app, or, uh, sorry, a file called .openshift markers hot deploy, your app's cartridges won't restart. So like Apache and MySQL won't restart during a push. You probably actually want this. I haven't put this into the press flow quick start, but we can actually just do this live a little bit later. And there's also a blog post. Again, these will all be links when I, I think when I put these these slides out here. So installing Drush. Um, most of the web framework cartridges have some ability to tie into a popular package manager. So like if you're running an NPM app, you can put a package.json in and it'll automatically install those NPM modules before your app starts. So like I actually, you guys know Hubot, the GitHub based kind of chat bot that can run an IRC or Jabber. So we actually use OpenShift to run uh, Hubot, I got a commit in that actually made it so it could work. And so we use that or like with Ruby, it supports using a gem file. So it'll do like just with Redmine, it did a bundle install when we pushed. So no different. I mean, the PHP cartridge supports pair and Drush is available from pair. So well, what about that? You know that's changing. I do, but that's okay. I mean, it works for now. 6.2, that's good enough. Yeah, actually, I think I use 6.0. So okay. Yeah, I don't think there's support for Composer yet, but it could certainly be added into the PHP cartridge again, where it could check and see like, if there's this OpenShift pair.txt file install stuff for pair, if there's a composer.json and composer.lock run a composer install. So I think there's actually already a card for that on the Trello board of like the development team. So like, I think it's on their radar. Yeah, so eventually, right. Sometime, I don't, is that gonna be Drush 7 or like some later release? That's, that's what it was. Okay, yeah. Right. Yep, so that's that's not there yet, but anything up to like any released version up to like 6.2. No, 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 I mean, it's a good point and it's, it's on the radar, definitely. So like, yeah, you can just actually literally in this file, which is called .openshift pair.txt, you can put in pair.drush.org, drush 600, you'll get it. If you need 5.9, great, you just change it. And on the next deploy, it'll install it for you. <coughs> Excuse me. And again, this is something where like, this has changed a little bit. So you might see if you look at some existing quick starts, this is called deplist.txt. So just know that like, if you see that, that means it was created a while ago. Like the new standard is this, this one still works. Generally the OpenShift team works really hard, even though they're like pushing forward with things like 
making it so that you can put your app in the root or using a thing that's called pair.txt. You know, for a while it's been out there. So they still keep things backwards compatible. So your apps won't just like break on you one day. So this I do actually want everyone to work on. Um, you know, I kind of showed you some of this information earlier uh, just when I was working through it, but let's all, uh, does everyone here, so how many people here are on Mac or Linux? All right. And for those on Windows, do you have Ruby? Yes. Okay. So if you do have Ruby, like basically um, there's a blog post you can find on openshift.com or basically, I mean, everyone tried doing a gem install RHC. If you're on Linux or on Mac, you'll probably have to do a pseudo gem install RHC. But actually go ahead and do that because we'll do that. And then once you do that, we can run the RHC setup command, which will ask you for your username and password. And then once that's done, you'll have command line access to create apps. I think in the new release, you can actually even clone apps like you were talking about. You could literally like take your dev app and make it into a stage one just automatically. Uh, you can SSH in. So yeah, everyone work on installing the RHC gem. And once you've got it going, then we'll actually be able to like SSH into your Drupal uh, apps. Oh, you're like, so you've installed the gem, but it can't. Uh... Yeah, and I, and I, I went with through and I add, added to the command line. <laughs> so you can do it anywhere. Oh, it can't find gem. Yeah. I see. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I usually use Sigwin when I'm on Windows, I think. Yeah, and this is, this is my machine that if I lose or damage, I don't care. What if you run git bash? I do get. Well, no, but I mean, what if you actually run the git bash command that was in your start menu there? Yeah. And just try running gem from here, see if it's in your path. Well, that's like, yeah, I should have done a field thing. That might actually work. Yeah. Well. I should have thought that earlier when I was trying to get um, X to the bug to work. You're smart man. See if that works. Well, it's, it's working. It's just, it's, because if it, if it didn't work, it would come back. It would come back. Okay. Usually it comes back very fast. Cool. Yeah. It's really important to be a kid set up to update here. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, if you're on Mac or Linux, you probably have to do sudo gem install RHC. Good, good, good. Oh, you're using RVM? Okay. May I? Uh, sure. Actually, if you're using RVM, I bet you don't need don't sudo. Need okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So once you have RHC installed, run RHC setup, and it will ask you for your OpenShift username and password. And once you type those in, it'll get it set up. And if this fails again, we can just run it with no RI, no RDoc, and because I think it's I think it's installing the gems, but it's choking on the documentation. Oh, okay. So. Okay. Yes, that's correct. No, the one you use when you signed up for OpenShift.com. You can try and guess my password, but it's very long and random, so I don't think you'll be able to. Well, actually. Which error message is that? Yes, because that'll that'll basically keep your credentials on your machine for like a week. Uh, yeah, so it'll automatically also upload your right. It'll upload your public key so that you can do a git clone or an RHC SSH. Uh, hmm. Can you switch back to, oh, what, what's your system Ruby on this machine? Uh, well, the Ruby, I'm sure that I pushed it to 1.0. Um, 
Right. Yeah, OS X may have a much older. Yeah, because it has 1.8.7. This is still mountain lion. Isn't it? Right. Maybe. It could be. Um, hmm. Let's see, you guys were getting undefined method I for. I like passphrase like fell because it's probably one I don't remember anymore. Oh, you couldn't unlock your key, basically? Uh, so okay. Yeah, I don't know that it's going to actually. Uh... Yeah, I don't. I mean, we we probably have to mess a little bit. So, all right. Do they need to get people to fill out the feedback form now? Can you just take it two seconds? Oh yeah, sure. That's absolutely perfect. It's a Retina display. You have a Retina. Are Is this correct? Okay. I'm using large text in Alfred to, to kind of show this. Because they weren't excellent presenters. <laughs> it's Alfred. So uh, Alfred's awesome. It's it's like a overall workflow engine. Like you can you can do a lot of stuff with it. I mean, I use a lot to just like launch programs or launch Apple scripts. But yeah, with Alfred you can. Uh, yeah. Uh, like Quicksilver had something like this too. Yeah, where you can just do. Like, so actually, one of the coolest things that Alfred has is integration with Dash. So let's say I want to like look up the Puppet file resource. Uh, I can do that, and then it'll open Dash. Like, there's a lot of really cool things. Or I can actually have, like, an IAM script that'll set all my stuff to away. Like, there's there's some really neat stuff that you can get with Alfred Repose. But, yes, you can just say nyctraining.drupalgardens.com. Yes. And then you do Command-L, and it shows it as big as can be on the screen, basically. <laughs> That's true. It is really useful, like, if you're in a, like, actually one time, so one of my coworkers, we were at Velocity Conference in Santa Clara a couple of years ago, and someone's like, yeah, and, like, someone's cell phone went off, and they were, like, Tim, my coworker, kind of passive-aggressively went, like, please quiet your phone and put large text on and just held his laptop up so everyone could see it. Yeah, it's really great when you actually want to, like, get someone to look. So this is a, a Mac-only program, unfortunately, called Alfred. Um, yeah. But uh, Alfred's great. It uh, it lets you do a lot of different things. Um, yeah, or you can, like, yeah, it, it has integration with Dash. So if I wanted to look up, like, the limit, you know, rec parameter of Nginx, you can, like, download, actually, so Dash is another app. Uh, Dash will download doc sets for you offline. So, like, if you wanted to say, oh, what's the um, Drupal is CLI documentation? They can keep, actually, like, Drupal... MySQL, Clojure, Puppet, Chef, Nginx, you name it. Uh, it can actually like look at a Ruby project and get all the stuff too. So very, very useful. There's also some things where I can like look up the weather. And, I mean, I just mostly use it for launching programs, but you can do a lot of stuff with it. Uh, you can actually like also search. Uh, so I could like find all the index.php things that we have. Anyway, long, far afield. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. No problem. So how did everyone do, I know you had, how did everyone do an RHC? Did everybody get set up so they can except connect to it? Right. Except for you. But that's actually okay. You can still do a lot without it. Yeah. So let's, um, 
Yeah, so let's take a look through, wow, we're getting close to time. Let's take a look at some things that you can do with RHC. So you can do RHC apps. And RHC apps will list all of your apps. And specifically, it'll list all your apps and what cartridges they have. So you can actually see, I've got a couple different apps here. I have my Drupal app, and it'll give you the name. This will show you the Git URL too, in case you need that, like to put it in a source tree or something. So like this will show, this is all also available in the web console, but if you just wanted to like grab it on your terminal, you can do this. It shows the initial Git URL, the SSH string that you would need to SSH in. Like if you can't use RHC SSH for some reason, you could still get the SSH info here. Uh, you can see here like how the deployment is set up. I think if we enable auto or hot deploy, that'll show differently. And then it just shows what, what cartridges it was built with. So it's using the cron cartridge, it's using the MySQL 5.5 cartridge, it's using the phase two Presto 7 cartridge, which we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, and it's using the PHP cartridge as the main like web framework gear. So, and then you can see like, there's actually only one gear. It's got PHP along with cron, MySQL, and my Presto cartridge on it. So like all that's running in one gear, because this is not a scalable app. If it were a scalable app, there'd be multiple PHP gears and then like database and other things back on their own. Again, that doesn't quite work out with Drupal yet, but we're working on that. Um, I'll actually take a quick side note too. So I don't only use OpenShift for Drupal stuff. I actually use it for a lot of other things just because it is so easy to deploy other technologies. I mentioned Clojure earlier. Um, so any of you guys use uh, Google Apps for your domain? Like is Google Apps your email and calendar and things like that? For your old company? So one of the things that I always hated was that um, it's not possible, at least in our setup, to uh, to take a look at um, like the Hangouts that you have from your Android phone or your iPhone. Like if you add a video call to something, it doesn't show up. At least on our domain, it doesn't show up. Um, so I actually hope I don't. I may censor this before I give it to you, Diane, if I show anything really uh, confidential here. But uh, so this is a Clojure app running on OpenShift. Clojure is like one of those community cartridges. It's a JVM uh, Lisp language, actually. So, and again, like I'm actually using the platform as a service. So I, you know, I have a key to connect to Google's APIs, but I just put it in an environmental variable. So there's no risk of that being stolen or being committed to the repo. Hey, there we go. And then, yeah, I've got this. And then I could, uh, you know, click on a thing and join a hangout if I wanted to. So that's another example of kind of, you know, a way that OpenShift is. So. Well, in this case, the Hangouts have already been created because they've been put on people's calendars. But the problem is that unless you read through the Google Calendar API, like it, it won't show up on my Android phone. But I can read it using the Google Calendar REST API. Right. So what was calendar you're reading at? That was my Esmeral at Phase 2 Technology calendar, which is a Google Apps calendar, basically. And you just log into Google Apps to see it? Yeah. So what, what were you, I don't understand how that. I mean, it's OAuth. It's just using OAuth delegation. The, the app code that does that is on OpenShift. Like the actual display, I wish I, well, I don't, oh, I do know my personal Google password. Let me change that. Uh, yeah, so this right here, this is actually running, this is closure code running on OpenShift. It is contacting Google Calendar. I've given it read-only access to my calendars. Closure is pulling that back and then displaying this grid. Correct, and the main reason that I use this, and I will probably remove this from the video, the main reason that I use this is that on my mobile, there's no way to get that info. Like on your mobile phone, you can't see the Hangout information in your calendar. But with this, I can launch this app on my mobile device and it goes. And it just happens to be a closure app deployed to OpenShift, so I host it for free. And then you also now, if you want to have to type multiple people into one Hangout system, it's your, whoever gets permission, see where they're hanging out and so forth. Yep, absolutely. Yep, that's all possible through the to the Google Calendar OAuth APIs. Um, okay, so we got kind of far field, right? We were talking about how I deploy other apps with other technologies to OpenShift. Uh, and then we actually have our Redmine app, right? So 
let's I, i'm afraid it's going to be time to kill red mine scott i know you'll be very very sad about that but i'm going to do an rhc app delete red mine <laughs> exactly so i will do this and again like making apps deleting apps you can do this all through the web console but the rhc gem is using the rest apis and actually if you wanted to just use like PHP or Java or Ruby to hit the REST APIs directly, you could do that too. Like there literally is an endpoint that this is all hitting against. And if you wanted to do that and authenticate with your token, you could do it. So like, like Eric, to your question, you could probably make a thing that would like given an OpenShift account, spin up three Drupal, like three Drupal sites, dev, stage, and prod using the REST API. That's totally possible. It could maybe even like pull back all the Drush configuration because you'll get the SSH info for each of them. So you could like make a Drush aliases file. You could absolutely do that because this is all REST APIs. Like you could do it through the gem. You could do it through the client library in Ruby. You could do it through PHP, like whatever you want to. It's it's all REST API calls. And there's some very good documentation online about how to interact with the OpenShift REST API. And again, online is running the same API as you would with your origin instance. Like it's all connected. It's all the same code base, which is pretty cool. So we're going to have to go a little quickly now because we're getting towards the end. Um, so one of the other things that I want to go through is, so, you know, you've now all deployed the the official Drupal quick start. I have a slightly updated um, Pressflow quick start. So how many here used Pressflow 6? Because back then it was kind of the only way to make Drupal scale, right? So, so Pressflow for 7 is not as important. Um, there is a Pressflow Drupal 7 version. So I, let me run through the rest of these slides real quick about optimizing Drupal and we'll go through this. So some of the nice things that, again, I've talked about that you can do with OpenShift is you can use the cron cartridge to run Drush. So you could run Drush cron basically to run all your cron tasks every hour. That's a good way to do that. Um, I'll, I'll show you this in our quick start when I go through it later. Um, you can set up you know, a drushrc.php so that you don't have to type in an alias. You can just do Drush whatever and it'll work. And that's actually also done in our Pressflow quick start and in the official quick start. So I made this other cartridge. It's not a language, it's not a technology, it's really just Gesundheit, just a little thing to uh, to work with the Pressflow settings. So Pressflow is a high performance fork of Drupal. It was created by Four Kitchens, contributed to by the Pantheon folks now. In D6, you really kind of had to run it if you had a big website, there were some things that Core was just very bad at. It's not nearly as important in Drupal 7. And in fact, the list of patches is pretty small in terms of what's different on Pressflow 7 versus Drupal 7. Um, but the things that are in Pressflow 7 make Drupal more platform as a service friendly. So one of the biggest things that it does, especially, and this helps Drupal run on actually both Pantheon and OpenShift, is you can put a variable called Pressflow settings in. And this, it actually just wants to be a big blob of JSON. And if you have this in there, it can override any key in either the dollar sign databases or the dollar sign conf array. And so what that means is like, you know, think about it. When you install Drupal, you generally have to like put in databases default default, you know, is driver MySQL, host this, user this, database this. Well, you can put that in the environment. And so again, then that becomes something where you don't have, like you can actually run Pressful 7 without a settings.php at all. As long as you have the database info in this Pressful settings variable, it just works. Same thing with anything in dot conf. So like if you wanted to like force CSS aggregation on in production, you could do that. Because in the Pressful settings thing, in the Pressful settings variable, you could set conf aggregate CSS true, aggregate JS true. There's one other conf setting that Pressflow 7 and Pressflow 7 only adds, which is called Pressflow Smart Start. And what Pressflow Smart Start does is if you bootstrap Drupal and the database is not installed, it'll take you to, to install that PHP automatically. So like normally, because like normally if you install Drupal, there is no settings.php and that's how it knows to go to the installer. Whereas here, there's probably actually already been some database config put in. And if you didn't have the setting, you just get a SQL error, right? You'd get a PDO error saying, there's no, there's no actions table, there's no cron table. But with this Pressflow Smart Start, it actually takes you right to the installer. So just like, like you do in Pantheon, it's a one click and you go there. So yeah, it could be semaphore cache. Like there's a couple of those that are in the early, early bootstrap. And if it's not there, it doesn't work. But with this, it'll just pump you the installer instead of giving you an ugly error screen. So I made a cartridge. It's a pretty simple one. And most of what it does is to write this Pressflow settings environmental variable for you. 
And it also sets conf, you know, press flow smart start to true. Um, to your question earlier, this also sets APC shim size to 160 megs. So if you're installing open atrium, which you know has a lot of modules, needs a lot of APC size, that'll do it. Um, and I think I might've made that configurable with an environmental variable too, I don't remember. So this is the link to it on GitHub. And I'll actually show you how that works now. I'm gonna go back out and uh, There we go. So I'm going to go back to this. I'm working on getting it so that this will be an official uh, sort of quick start that you can start up from the web console. But I'm going to use RHC app create. So RHC app create is the way that from the terminal with the RHC program, you can spin up a new app. And again, I'll show you in just a sec. This works against Origin 2 and Enterprise. The thing is that, that long line of code is in the readme files in the Git repo. Yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll tweet that out later, the link to the like press flow quick start so that even it'll probably, it'll eventually be available in the web console. It might actually become the default Drupal 7 cartridge. Maybe we got to figure that out, but it'll probably be an option. But yeah, I can actually just go to my terminal now. Oh, goodbye, Redmine. That's out of there. And I will do this. So does app create the first, um, the first option will be the name of the app that we create, which will be Drupal. So actually maybe I should call this press flow. I don't remember if I still have my Drupal app or not. So I'll call this press flow. And then it has the cartridges. So it'll be a PHP 5.3 app with MySQL 5.5 because online has MySQL 5.5. It'll have the cron cartridge, which will actually mean that, you know, the app is up. Um, Drush cron will be run every hour by that. Now this thing, cart reflect Clayton devs.rhcloud.com. Basically um, when you have downloadable cartridges, you can do one of two things. You can write them up and in the manifest for the cartridge, you can put a link to a zip file that has like the whole downloadable cartridge. Or uh, Clayton Coleman, who's a really smart guy who works on the Red Hat team actually just came up with his own OpenShift app that can look at a public GitHub repo and sort of make that manifest for you. So basically, this is just basically saying make a downloadable cartridge out of Smeril, OpenShift, Community, Pressful 7 on GitHub. So that's gonna get my Pressful settings cartridge that does that thing of setting the Pressful settings variable and setting those things to true. And then this, the dash dash from code, that's the same thing you had in the web console. This is where you select a quick starter. Basically you select a different Git repo to start from than the default one that PHP would normally give you. So I'll hit this. And so this is our equivalent of the spinny going, well, this is spinning up. Let's go take a look at the app. So, I, you know, this can maybe kind of bring us together on some of the things we talked about. So, you know, I previously talked about how there were different things in the dot open shift directory, right? Like the action hooks that could do things at a particular time. So I'm gonna to go to the action hooks directory here. So we implement build, which happens the first time this app is built, deploy, which will run every time it's deployed, um, post deploy, and then we're also doing something pre-stop PHP and post start PHP. So let's take a look at build first. So build is gonna get run the very first time that I make the app. And as I talked about, this is gonna make a dot drush directory and it's gonna set up a drushrc.php. So it'll set the memory limit to minus one so you don't get memory errors when you run drush, right? And then it'll say, okay, the URI is gonna be, and this is pulling from underscore n, so it's pulling from those environmental variables. So this is setting the URI option to whatever our app name is, and the root will be openshift repo dir slash php, because at least we know that's, you know, that's the path to Drupal root. So this is what means, this is what makes the when we SSH in, I can run drush cc all or drush sql dump or whatever I want that works. So there's the deploy script. Um, all this is saying is that basically, uh, if the press flow character is installed, update those settings, update that press flow settings variable. So like if the database, if you uninstalled and reinstalled MySQL, it'll put that in there. So then let's look at first pre-stop PHP. So one of the problems, not problems, one of the things that Drupal does for you is it tries to make it so your settings file isn't writable, right? It'll actually try and set your site's default directory to be unwritable. Well, the problem is OpenShift wants to deploy that with Git, right? And if it can't delete this directory, it won't do it. So one of the things that we do in this action hook is we say, go ahead and make sure that for any sites directory you find that's not sites all, make sure it's writable. That's just, if you don't do this, you'd actually get deployers. It would say, I can't write over sites default. Okay, great. So that happens. Um, and then in pre, oops, that's pre-stop PHP. 
And then in post start PHP, what we do is we say, okay, because remember, if we kept the if we kept the Drupal files directory in the repo dir, it would get written over when we did a git push, which we definitely do not want. If you've uploaded some images and that goes away, that's a bad thing to happen. So what we do is we actually say, okay, make a directory called slash files in the data directory. Um, and then in the repo at PHP sites default files, make a symlink. So all this is gonna do is after the app, after PHP has started, it'll symlink that files directory into place just to make sure that it persists even as we do a bunch of pushes to the app. So that's basically the automation that we've got in here to make things support. And then I think I actually also, in post deploy, I'm actually doing one more thing where if we're running on PHP 5.5, uh, I set up you know, DB file per table, which is a little optimization to make sure that our table space doesn't keep growing, but that's not nearly as important. So there are no cartridges that match cron. Oh, I put some extra spaces in here. How good that I came back. Let's try that again. Uh, yeah, I might, you know, this could have come out of how I was, oh, you are absolutely correct. Let's try this again. Ah, oh, you're killing me, Smalls. All right, so just as Diane mentioned, I'm going to go to GitHub instead. Yep, and I will grab this. There. Oh, because I already made an app called Drupal. Makes sense. Yeah, so we will call this Nice Camp. Yeah, there we go. So that's spinning up. So how about well, this is spinning up? So Diane mentioned Origin. Uh, you guys want to see? So you know, let me log into. I think I'm logged into OpenShift or com. Yeah. So this is OpenShift Online. You know, we're making a nice camp app right now. Now let me also log into broker.openshift.phase2technology.com. And this is a uh, high memory instance running on Google Compute Engine. And this is OpenShift Origin. So it's literally like 99% the same. This is your copy. And again, you can put this on a huge server. You could put it on SSD disks if you need it to be really fast. It still works with the RHC client. It still works with private keys. It still works with domains. Like this is the whole thing. This is the whole reason that OpenShift is so interesting to me at least is that it is fully open source. I took a CentOS image, doesn't require RHEL, works on CentOS. I ran, uh, so there's a site called install install.openshift.com. It gives you these instructions, a little uh, shell script that you can curl down and you have your own platform as a service. Basically like this gives you a full command line thing that you can step through. It'll ask like, do you want to make this all on one machine? Do you want to have one machine that's the broker and then three nodes? Like it walks you through all of this, applies all the configuration using Puppet and you have a platform as a service.